Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 116, I believe it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be ranting away at you with things important to me that I think are worthy of your attention. As always, any comments, questions, reactions, whatever, should be sent to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, uh, and you can uh, leave a comment there, or you can get the email address from there. Uh, as always, again, uh, if you send me email, I just ask that you're a little patient about getting a reply. I'm a little slow about answering my email. And uh, please include something in the subject line, like left side of the aisle or your cable, just something so I know it's not spam. All right, with those uh, traditional introductions out of the way, we'll get to it. I got a couple of uh, sort of like good news, bad news things to start us off this week. The uh, first one involves a man named Jeffrey David Olson. He's uh, from San Diego. And he was angered by the Bank of America's immoral, unethical, and illegal treatment of people caught up in their web of mortgage and foreclosure intrigue. Uh, even more so by the fact that none of this uh, seemed to be of any concern to federal regulators or law enforcement. So he started a message campaign because he said Wall Street banks have done more than any others to drive our economy into a ditch. And he said, quote, there was basically a criminal racket operating on my block, and I didn't find that acceptable. So he took to writing statements on the sidewalk in front of three Bank of America branches in San Diego. He used children's sidewalk chalk, the kind that washes off in a rain or scuffs away in a few days. Uh, and between April and August of last year, he left 13 such messages. Uh, things like, no thanks, big banks, and shame on Bank of America, and so on. Well, as a result, after the local security officer for Bank of America prodded the city attorney's office, Olson was charged with 13 counts of vandalism, each of which carried a maximum of a year in prison and a thousand dollar fine. Now, the case got some attention for two reasons. One, beyond, well, being beyond the just absurdity of the whole idea. One is that the statute in question requires that something, to be, uh, something be maliciously defaced in order to qualify as vandalism. This is a, like a graffiti statute. Now, since there was no physical damage, again, and uh, the chalk, again, could easily be removed, uh, or in fact removed for, for free if it happened to rain in San Diego, the only possible application of the word malicious was to the words he used, the content of his message, which would seem to make this an open and shut case of First Amendment rights. Which brings up the second reason it got attention. The judge in the case, one Howard Shore, granted a prosecutorial motion to forbid Olson from using in, in his defense the phrases First Amendment, free speech, free expression, public forum, expressive conduct, or political speech. The law, he said, uh, does not mention uh, First Amendment rights, which means he was thereby elevating a local law about graffiti above the Constitution. Shore later imposed a gag order on Olson, barring him from talking to the media about his case. Remember, we're talking about a misdemeanor graffiti case. So according to the city prosecutor here, you can potentially face 13 years in prison for expressing your opinion with washable chalk if a giant corporation wants it to be so. And according to Judge Shore, you can be banned from complaining that you've been forbidden to argue that being threatened with 13 years in prison is a violation of your free speech. All right, so what's the good news here? Last week, uh, well, first, people rallied around him. Uh, they actually had a demonstration where they went to the Hall of Justice where the trial was being held and they wrote messages about free speech on the sidewalk. Second, he was acquitted of all 13 counts, as the jury showed much more sense than the police, the prosecutors, or the judge did. And to make it all the sweeter, San Diego Mayor Bob Filner condemned the city attorney's office, saying the whole case was a waste of time. There's a footnote to this, by the way. Uh, after the acquittal, Judge Shore complained that the media had sensationalized the case. Um, which is not surprising. Vampires usually do their best work in the dark. All right, here's another one. 
in this case the good news comes first. In the past two months, over the past two months, there have been demonstrations every week at the state capitol in Raleigh, North Carolina. The weekly protests are known as Moral Monday, and they are intended to show opposition to the increasingly reactionary stance of the state legislature, which seems determined to plunge North Carolina headlong into the 19th century. The numbers of these demonstrations have ranged from dozens to up to 3,000, and the focus of the protests have ranged from legislation that rejected the expansion of Medicaid for the working poor, slashed benefits to the unemployed, and eliminated jobs in uh, public education, as well as others that address not directly economic issues like natural gas drilling, school vouchers, and voting rights. Over 700 people have been arrested in nonviolent civil disobedience over these weeks, and there doesn't seem to be any indication that these demonstrations are going to stop. One of the biggest turnouts was this week, in the wake of the state Senate's under, uh, underhanded passage last week of new restrictions on access to legal abortions. Now, the body had been considering a bill to ban the application of, uh, of foreign law in family courts. This was known as the anti-Sharia law ordinance, and a lot of people in the state felt that the whole purpose of this bill was to stir up anti-Muslim sentiment. But the thing is, at the last minute, with no public uh, notice, no hearings, no debate, the troglodyte majority added to the bill a series of measures requiring uh, that abortion clinics conform to the same safety standards as ambulatory surgical centers. And this is a totally medically unnecessary requirement uh, and was actually instituted in the hopes that it will force most of these clinics to shut down because they can't afford the money to make the necessary changes. All this was done in less than 24 hours, a period even the Gopper governor of North Carolina, Pat McCrory, said was unfairly rushed. Well, come Monday, 2,000 people jammed the state capitol and 64 were arrested for refusing to leave. Now, the protests may have had some impact. Leaders in the state house say that they're going to consult more with state regulators before deciding whether or not they're going to vote on these restrictions. And in fact, uh, the state secretary of health and human services, her name is Aldona Wos, uh, already she already said that if safety is actually the issue here, as the proponents of these measures always lyingly claim it is, that if safety of the women is actually the issue, that increased state funding for more inspections of the clinics would do more towards that end. Now, if the bill isn't passed by the end of the current session, which could end as, as early as next week, uh, they'll have to wait till January to bring it up again. State Senator Erlene Parman called this a small victory, which is true. It is a small victory, but it's still a victory. Uh, and, and the protests, the Moral Mondays, they go on Monday after Monday. And the thing is to know that people uh, have not given up that people are still taking to the streets, that people are prepared to put their bodies on the line, that people are prepared to keep that fire lit. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that is really good news. What's the bad news part here? It's necessary. The fact that the protests, the fight, the civil disobedience, and all of this is necessary is the bad news part. Uh, and there's a footnote to this. Uh, worth mentioning is the fact that among the people who have been arrested in these demonstrations is one Reverend Frederick Battle. The last time he was arrested was in 1962 when he took part in the historic Woolworths department store sit-in in Greensboro, North Carolina. And if you don't know about that, look it up. All right, one more. One more final bit of sort of good news, bad news. Walmart, as I've I've discussed here before, continues to face a mounting labor movement as, as its exploited workers come to feel that they really have nothing to lose by speaking up for themselves. A union-backed group called Our Walmart has been conducting a campaign called Making Change at Walmart to push for improved hours, pay, and benefits for its workers. Many of Walmart's one and a half million employees just make barely more than minimum wage and a lot of them rely on things like food stamps and other government aid to get by. Uh, 
The corporation is notoriously anti-union, even flying in teams of union busters to stores at the first sign of labor activity. This May, in fact, Walmart posted a job listing for a director of labor relations whose job duties were described as maintaining a continued union-free workplace. Those who do try to organize face retaliation. According to our Walmart, 11 workers who support the organization were fired last month alone. Now, Walmart insists that all this labor activism is trivial, it's baseless, that in the words of corporate flunky Randy Hargrove, our associates have chosen to remain union free. But the good news here, it turns out that some of the company's large investors just aren't buying it anymore. Two large European pension funds have announced that they would no longer invest in Walmart, charging that the company does not treat its employees in accordance with international labor standards of freedom of association, and it has failed to respond to their concerns. This comes after these uh, pension funds have spent five years trying to get Walmart to adopt the standards of the International Labor Organization. In a media release just on Monday, one of the pension funds called Walmart's effort to block unionization, quote, as being contrary to fundamental principles and rights at work. And when a final request for the company to accept international standards was met with a response from the company that essentially said, we ain't even going to consider the idea, well, uh, and one of the executives of one of these uh, two funds said it was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Now, this is not the first such case. Uh, last year, the largest pension fund in the Netherlands divested from Walmart for failing to comply with the UN's Global Compact, which sets standards related to, to uh, labor, uh, human rights, corruption, and the environment. And again, uh, the good news here is that this is happening. The bad news is that it's necessary. By the way, there's a footnote to this one, too. As pressure slowly builds on Walmart from one direction, the company's looking to another, apparently realizing that its corporate Im image needs a little polishing. I guess is a good word. Nearly 20 American retailers, including Walmart, have agreed to a five-year safety plan for Bangladesh garment factories that would include inspecting every factory within a year. This comes in the wake of the fire in November that killed 112 people in one Bangladesh garment factory and the over 1,100 who were crushed in the collapse of another one in April. Now, unfortunately, this deal won't do very much. The companies involved here had declined to join an agreement that had been worked out in May with mostly European companies that is A, binding, and B, includes requirements for independent inspections of the factories and requires the signatories to stop doing business with the companies that fail to meet the standards. None of that is true of the agreement that Walmart joined. It is, in other words, a little more, little more than apple polishing. But still, it does mean that Walmart... Now, Walmart, remember, when the factory in Bangladesh collapsed, Walmart said really it had nothing to do with them. They had no responsibility for this, no involvement in this, nothing to do with them at all. Well, now it's apparently realizing that Walmart recognizes that at least for public relations purposes... It does have to pay some attention to the conditions under which Bangladesh workers labor so that we can save a couple of bucks and a pair of socks. That, at least, is good news. All right, one last thing before I go to break. It's one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week, the big red nose goes to State Police Colonel Timothy Albin, who, because he handled a lot of the press relations, uh, stands in for the entire security complex at this year's July 4th events at the Esplanade. Forces from the Boston Police, the Cambridge Police, the Transit Police, the State Police, the FBI, and the National Guard were out there by the hundreds in unprecedented numbers because they wanted to, in Albin's words, make people feel this was a safe place to be. To that end, beyond the swarms of cops and troops, there were what was said to be an exponentially larger number of surveillance cameras watching your every move. There was a special number where you could uh, anonymously, supposedly at least, anonymously text the cops if you saw anything that you thought suspicious. 
There were fewer open entrances to the Esplanade. There were more security checkpoints on the Esplanade. And people were prohibited from bringing in backpacks, coolers on wheels, cans, glass containers, premixed beverages, liquids greater than two, two liters, or any sharp objects. All to make you feel safe. In fact, people were made to feel so safe that a lot of them didn't bother going. Attendance was down by 40% over previous years. Now, officials made all sort, uh, sorts of excuses for the low turnout. Uh, a Boston Globe photo of the area in front of the hat shell, taken about 5.30, showed what the paper described as an unusually large amount of green space. Uh, Steve McDonald of Boston 4 Productions, which produces the event, uh, he, he did, he, well, it's, it's a late arriving crowd. Uh, he predicted a large influx of people after the sun went down. Alban blamed the temperature, as did Governor uh, Deval Patrick, who claimed that an aerial view showed that the outline of the crowd matched the outline of the shade, which since the events take place at night, shade would not seem to be a particular consideration here. Now, obviously realizing that the crowd was embarrassingly small as the day wore on, officials kept encouraging people to come. It'll be great, they said. It'll be wonderful. Come one, come all. Never mind the searches, never mind the soldiers, never mind the cameras, never mind the secrecy, never mind the restrictions. Come celebrate America. Alban actually summed it up rather well, admittedly unintentionally. He said, quoting, we want you all to come and enjoy this celebration, which is the heart of America. Unfortunately, to an increasing extent, that's true. We're going to take a break. Hi, and we're back. Uh, two things should have become clear from recent events in Egypt. Uh, two treasured notions of American political mythology that have been brought into serious question. One, that elections equal freedom, and two, that people power equals justice. Now, after the dictator Hosni Mubarak was brought down, yes, by people power with some military backing, Egypt had its first free elections. The outcome was the election of President Mohamed Morsi and the domination of parliament by the Freedom and Justice Party, the political arm of the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood. A new constitution was then drafted by an assembly chosen by the parliament, which means also the assembly was dominated by Islamists, who, despite their repeated promises and assurances of respect for religious and political minorities in Egypt, tried to ram through a document that made civil government subservient to Sharia law, that is, subservient to fundamentalist Muslim religious law. The assembly was controversial enough that uh, a number of the non-Islamist members just dropped out of it, gave up on it, and courts were considering whether or not to disband it. But Morsi decreed that you can't do that, and his supporters in the assembly pushed through the final draft. That version, with its strong Islamist flavor, uh, flavor uh, was passed in a referendum that got about 60% of the vote in a turnout of about 30%. So first, let's not forget, Morsi was democratically elected in Egypt's first free elections, an election that people power ultimately did help bring about, but the overall result was not freedom. Uh, not unless you think the word can comfortably be applied to a constitution and a government that's oriented more toward theocracy than, uh, than uh, democracy. Now, dissatisfaction with Morsi's rule grew until it finally exploded into the streets with an odd coalition of liberals, Christians, Mubarak supporters, Sal Salafists, Al-Azhar scholars, the military, and so on. People power again filled Tahrir Square and with thousands, hundreds of thousands of people demanding that Morsi go. And was the result justice? No, it was a military coup. A military coup that has now arrested hundreds of Morsi supporters, as well as shooting down more than 50 of them in the worst single incident of bloodshed in the, la in the two and a half years of turmoil. Oh, and a military coup, by the way, which the U.S. refuses to call a military coup, because if it did, it would be required by law to cut off the $1.3 billion in military aid we send to Egypt every year, and there's no way the government wants to do that. 
thing is, people power is not in charge in Egypt. The military is. And the military has set up its own timetable for drafting yet another constitution for, uh, and, and elections for yet another parliament, all of which are to take place within the next six and a half months. The speed, apparently, to smooth the ruffled feathers of Western governments. But here's where it gets extra interesting. Under the timetable issued Monday by Interim Pre President Adli Mansour, two appointed panels would be created. The first would be made up of judges who would come up with proposed amendments to the Constitution. The other larger body would consist of representatives of society and political movements, and they would debate these amendments and approve or whatever them, and then the final version would go to a referendum. Okay, well, aside from the question of just who gets to decide what uh, representatives of society and political movements get to take part and how large a voice each of them has, the fact is that the judges who are going to come up with the amendments made their careers under Hosni Mubarak. And now they're the ones who are going to come up with the amendments that the other body is supposed to debate. So do elections equal freedom? Not when they become the classic tyranny of the majority. And does people power produce justice? Not when it starts with the necessary no, but then never goes beyond that. Meanwhile, the Muslim Brotherhood has rejected the whole New Deal, calling it an attack on democracy, and has called on its supporters to rise in opposition, which they have. As the saying goes, watch this space. Now, there is sort of a footnote to this. A, uh, an ex one of those examples of I laugh for fear of crying. It comes courtesy of New York Times columnist David Brooks. In a column last week defending the coup, Brooks declares that, quote, it's not that Egypt doesn't have a recipe for a democratic transition. It seems to lack even the basic mental ingredients. That's right. According to David Brooks, Egypt's difficulties in establishing a real democracy are not due to decades of repressive government, not due to inexperience in self-government, but because the people of Egypt don't have the cognitive capacity to manage it. And it's not just Egypt, he says. Islamists are the problem. Islamists in general are the problem. They, quote, lack the mental equipment to govern. Incompetence is built into their intellectual DNA. They are, he said, incapable of running a modern government. As evidence, he cites the case of Egypt, Turkey, Iran, Gaza, Palestine, and Algeria. All right. First, forget Egypt. Uh, you can't cite as evidence the very thing you're trying to prove, which is that the coup was justified. So what are the rest? Well, Turkey and Iran have both shown dramatic economic improvements, including the lives of their poor over the last 10 years. Now, you can condemn both the increasing authoritarianism of the government of Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, you can condemn the repression by the mullahs in Iran, that's not the same as saying they're incompetent. In Gaza, Hamas actually has a reputation for being very good at delivering social services. Again, you don't have to approve of a government to recognize it's competent. And finally, to top it off, neither Palestine nor Algeria have or ever have had an Islamist government. As is all too often true, David Brooks has no idea what the heck it is he's talking about. The man is a complete jackass. And when I think that this man is a columnist for the New York Times, I laugh so I don't cry. All right. From there, our other regular weekly feature. This is the outrage of the week. According to a new report for the Center for Investigative Reporting, between 2006 and 2010, doctors in California prisons illegally sterilized at least 148 female inmates, and there are perhaps 100 more dating back to the late 1990s. Doctors coerced these women into getting tubal ligations, which were conducted without required state approvals, and which targeted women which the staff felt were likely to return to prison. Dr. James Heinrich, an OBGYN who did or oversaw a lot of these procedures, declined ever pressuring the women, insisting instead that he was providing an important service, an attitude that could only be described as condescendingly paternalistic, and which was echoed by Dawn Martin. She was the top medical uh, manager at California's Valley State Prison from 2005 to 2008. She creepily characterized these surgeries as a matter of empowerment 
for the women. This despite the fact that she admitted that when she learned the procedure required state approval on a case-by-case -case basis, she and Heinrich tried to find ways around the regulations, such as calling tubal ligations medical emergencies. Exactly how this involves empowerment remains a mystery. We had a name for this kind of brutality in years past. We called it eugenics, where we decided that certain types of people were inferior and should not be allowed to reproduce. At one time, 32 states had compulsory sterilization directed at minorities, the poor, the disabled, the mentally ill, and prisoners. It wasn't until 1979 that California banned the practice. And if you have any doubt that that's what's going on here, consider the words of Dr. Heinrich, who said any woman who now claims she didn't want the surgery is lying and is, quoting him, somebody looking for the state to give them a handout and who just, quoting again, wants to stay on the dole. Told of the nearly $150,000 the state spent paying uh, contract surgeons to do the operations, he called that figure minimal, especially, quoting again, compared to what you save in welfare as they procreated more. All right, here's the thing. If you don't find those words to be those of a bigot, if you do not find this whole business a sordid, foul, stinking outrage, you should stop watching this show and instead spend that time trying to contemplate where your moral development went so disastrously wrong. This is the outrage of the week. All right, finally, a bit of good news to make you feel all warm and fuzzy. The, uh, Illinois legislature has just overridden Governor Pat Quinn's conditional veto, making the land of Lincoln the 50th and final state to allow concealed carry of firearms. That's right. Now, everywhere you go in this great nation, from sea to shining sea, the person muttering to themselves as they walk past you on the street, the person getting uncomfortably loud at the next table at the restaurant, the obnoxious fan in the bowl game with a few too many beers in them, the driver leaning on their horn, the old guy screaming, hey, you kids, get off my lawn. Every one of them could be packing heat. Doesn't that make you feel safe? Now, in fairness to the legislatures, they were, you'll pardon the expression, under the gun. Uh, in one of those bizarre guns are my master, must obey guns decisions, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals had declared the state's ban on carrying concealed weapons an unconstitutional infringement on the sacred Second Amendment. The court gave the state until July 9th to come up with a new law. Lawmakers feel that failure to act would mean that after that time that there'd be no gun regulation of any kind in Illinois. Whether that is true, whether it would have obviated local ordinances is unclear, but still, they felt pressure to act. Uh, the law does have a list of places off limits to guns, including schools, libraries, parks, and mass transit buses and trains, but here's the question. If the guns are concealed, how are you going to enforce this? unless you want to search everybody that wants to get on a bus or go into a library. Now, one place people can be searched, of course, is at an airport. Uh, and the TSA has started keeping track of the number of firearms that uh, people are trying to take onto planes. Uh, in 2012, it was up 17% over 2011. So far in 2013, it's up 30% over 2012. That in May, the, the TSA set a record for the number of guns uh, um, uh, seized in one week, 65. 45 of them loaded, 15 of those had bullets in the chamber. The most common excuse, I forgot it was there, which I don't know about you, but I do not find very reassuring. We're going to end up with our regular weekly reminder. As of July 10th, at least 6,022 Americans have died as the result of gunfire since Newtown. 61 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week.